Hello, my name is Kevon Blakemore Johnson, and I am the Vice President of Aaron Phoenix Productions. The Aaron Phoenix Board of Directors believes that Black Lives Matters, indeed. And we stand behind the fight for decent human rights. However, we are also fighting for another group of human beings fighting for their unalienable rights along with Black Lives Matters. During 1969, Blacks were fighting for their rights then as in now. And so was the LBGT community as they took on New York with Stonewall riots, which was a series of spontaneous, violent demonstrations by members of the LGBT community in response to a police raid that began in the early morning hours of June 28, 1969 at the, at the Stonewall Inn in Greenwich Village neighborhood of Manhattan, New York City. However, two strong individuals stand out in the fight for trans people, Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson. As we celebrate Pride, we are happy to present to you Transcribed, Voices of Trans, Non-Binary, and Intersex People. Take a look at their struggles to feel whole, their journey to breathe free, their journey to live their truths. Transcribed consists of 10 monologues. Each of these monologues were written and performed by people of the LGBT community, and we respect them dearly for sharing their truths. Listen as these stories illustrate how these individuals move in the world. We would like to call out Tony McDade, a Black trans man that was killed May 27th. As our nation goes through its next reconstruction, Let's include trans and non-binary rights. Trans people have one of the highest incidents of violence and murder and are the least reported. In 2018, the HRC uh, Human Rights Campaign reports that advocates tracked at least 26 deaths in January of that year due to violent murders. Black transgender or non-conforming gender people are often forced into unemployment, poverty, homelessness, and sometimes survival sex work. This project was developed by Eugene Colvin, a high school student who described himself as a creative gay trans man. The inspiration for Transcribed came about when Eugene showed his father his high school essay about his early trans experiences. Doug, his father explained, uh, I thought it was brilliant that he should, and he should write more. He thought it would be a great to create a, a solo monologue show. This morphed into transcribed a series of many voices because Eugene felt that there were many more voices that needed to be heard other, on top of his own. And they are indeed shall be heard. These performances are a fundraiser for Aaron Phoenix Productions and 50% of the proceeds will go to the Gender Health Center and their mission. They're currently raising money to help transgendered people, transgender people of color who have been affected by COVID-19. You can donate through url.bit.ly backslash transcribed. We at Aaron Phoenix Productions are standing up with our trans and non-binary brothers and sisters in solidarity to fight for acceptance, strength, and the power to tell their stories. Happy Pride. Don't you dare say you know how I feel.
you'll never know what it's like to stand outside the bathroom and decide what risks to take. Do you take the risk of being sneered and glared at and whispered about? Or do you take the risk of being beat up or worse? You'll never know what it's like to tell your parents who you are and have them throw you out of your house, to have them yell at you and beat you senseless, to have them tell you you are a mistake and they wish you were dead. You'll never know what it's like. <laughs> But you'll also never know what it's like to finally hear someone say your name. You'll never know what it's like to go to an event filled with people just like you who are happy and free and enjoying their life. And if they can do it, so can you. You'll never know what it's like to tell someone you love that you aren't what they think and have them say, I don't care. I love you. You'll never know what it's like. I envy you sometimes, and everyone like you. It's this disgusting ball of jealousy in my stomach that makes you want to lash out in anger. But I don't. And that's the difference between you and me. You see, because you will never know what it's like to feel hateful for, towards everyone above you and still choose to be nice and kind and caring and hopeful anyway. So don't even think for a second that you won't understand how I feel because you don't and you never will. Expectations are a funny thing. When the doctors told my parents that they were having a boy, they expected that they knew what they were talking about. From my earliest memory, my father expected me and him to have the father-son relationship that he never had with his father. At the same time that I'm expecting God to hear my prayers and see my tears and deliver me to a body that I was always meant to inhabit. See, we're not born with expectations, it's something we learn. We're taught that God loves all his children and makes no mistakes. But when I was in middle school, I learned to expect the worst from people and that femininity is a flaw. In high school, when I began to pass as a man, my friends thought that the smile on my face and the bravado in my voice were true signs of happiness. Never knowing that every day I woke up wondering if today was the day that I would climb the ladder of expectation, walk to the edge of self-loathing and take that leap of faith 20 stories down, hoping that damnation is better than that lie. When I started transition, people began to tell me what was expected of me as a woman and I learned I should never expect the world to see me as one. My individual body parts became a topic of conversation, something that genetic women have learned to expect. After years of harassment, being told to take that ass slap or that cat call is a compliment. But if I've learned anything from the history of my people, it's that if they realize I'm not what they expect, I won't have to jump. They'll be more than happy to drown me in an ocean of misunderstanding. So when I walk through that sea of stairs and refuse to break their gaze and their eyes fall to the physical scars, I wonder if they expect that the reason for me doing this is to fit into a box that I was never meant to inhabit or that this shadow on my face is a mask I use to hide the shame of who I am. But these scars are not the edges of my box. They are the purple heart I earned in the war for self-acceptance. This shadow on my face is not a mask I hide behind. It's my attempt at painting life back into these dull eyes that hadn't seen the glint of a true smile since testosterone first started playing Big Brother with my brain. Look, we all unsuccessfully try to predict the future, but you'll never know what's around the corner unless you choose to walk that line. 
and see what's on the other side of self-discovery. If I've learned anything about expectations, it's that they usually shatter. So help me pick up the pieces so we can build a future where our children don't flee this life in adolescence, leaving behind only a tombstone with a name that they don't identify with or a truth that was never spoke. Expectations are a funny thing and they can be more dangerous than any of us realize. identity, a personal exploration, yet completely dependent on the interactions, power dynamics, social rules, and stereotypes around me. They all yell at me simultaneously with opposing messages. The one thing they share, trying to convince me I'm doing it wrong. The two most powerful warring factions are masculinity and femininity, or at least the standard societal definitions of such. I still can't figure out if my good friends, mask and femme, are helping me explore my identity or just adding to the fake news of who I'm supposed to be. I walk by a group of what I assume to be cis guys and have an identity crisis. Mask rears its head, tells me to swagger, to lead with my chest, warning me I'm not man enough. I'm in a face-off of broness and I can't compete. But then femme kicks in, an encroaching submissiveness. I need them to find me desirable, to want my body. The familiar conflation of attractiveness and worth, the objectification and inferiority I associate with womanhood. I'm afraid of their judgments and projections even as I contrive my own. I know nothing about these people. This entire interaction, a brief meeting of the eyes. It is not humans I am dealing with, but constructs. Fen puts Mask in a headlock and Mask growls back. The struggle ensues against a backdrop of bubbling anxiety. Every posture and movement I make is an enormous label defining who I am. I don't want to feel gendered. I want the feeling I get when I go exploring in the creek. When I leap from rock to rock, my nerves attuned to the sounds around me, my muscles gauging every jump, my feet adjusting to each new surface. The graceful strength of every tendon exerting the exact right amount of effort. The feeling of aliveness that is just me. Where mask and femme have no place. Or if they do, it's because I invite them in on my terms. They can be fun playmates, sometimes, allowing me to slip in and out of different parts of myself, when my body wields them instead of them wielding my body. But the minute there are people, not trees, watching me, my body loses that sense of flow, and mask and femme attempt to eat each other for dinner. I went to the Friday dance sessions at noon to access this flow again, to let my body explore how it wanted to move instead of imposing movement on it. While everyone else on campus meandered to the dining hall for lunch, a select few found ourselves in the acting classroom, lights dim, disco ball gleaming, club music rocking the building, a late night party in mid-afternoon. We even had a DJ, a good DJ. When I danced to that music that I would never listen to in any other context, I tried to let my body release whatever it was holding and become art. But as I danced, I was plagued by more questions. Sometimes pleasant curiosities and other times painful self-consciousness. What movements belonged to mask, to femme? Did it have to be one or the other? Did Graceful movements come more naturally to me than aggressive ones because I was socialized female. I loved feeling light and beautiful and delicate, but that wasn't all I loved feeling. 
The handful of other dancers were guys thumping and swaggering and moving with dignity and power. I wanted to dance like one of the guys, whatever that meant. I let mask take over and felt happy, angry, powerful, unstoppable, and so alive. A female student walked in and started to dance with us. She wore a mini skirt and crop top, hoop earrings and makeup. She deftly wielded her attractiveness in the way she occupied space. Every male gaze in the room swiveled to her, dogs panting, waiting for the ball to be thrown. For a brief minute, I felt competition. Femme whispered in my ear, you could never draw attention like that. I was suddenly angry that my safe space of expressivity and experimentation had become so hetero cis normative. But as I looked around the room at Mask and Femme playing their game around me, I began to laugh. Whether the other dancers realized it or not, we were all performing gender together. Embarrassment, an emotion that instantly comes to mind whenever I think of the first moments of transitioning. Society tells you to wear pieces of fabric that either represent male or female. Male or female. Some of us blur the lines. Some of us never quite wear fabrics that feel they are proper to our own images. Then the lucky ones pick and choose their desired attire for representation. You venture into these retailers that offer a wide range of choices, and you notice the one to the opposite end to yours is what you have always longed to wear. With enough courage, I ask, Dad, can I try on this suit? I like the blue one. Eyes then glancing my way with sarcastic confusion. This is for men. Where's your mother? Go find her. Sure, thank you. What was I even thinking? Embarrassment. The emotion that continues as a growing barrier. That day, the feelings of embarrassment lingered to where the second floor of the mall looked all too convincing as the escape I needed. I'll never forget feeling the cool metallic surface of the railing in my hands. Tears welling up into my eyes, blurring the vision below. But in that moment, I said, no. No, this isn't how my story goes. After regaining some strength, I made a second attempt, this time at home. Standing next to the sofa where my father's eyes were set on some program on the television. Dad, I want to be a man. This time, the response came after a long pause. A nervous drink of the chilled soda pop followed by an overly loud gulp. Okay, if that's how you feel. <laughs> Was this some cruel joke? Was I being accepted? Was I being given the hand I needed on this massive journey ahead of me? Just so you know, you'll never be a man, a real man. But if that's how you feel. A nervous smile hides the pain. <laughs> a soft chuckle brushes the idea off. 
All right. I got it off my chest. But now, now I get it. This is a journey I will be embarking on by myself. No support, no assistance, no kind words. My first visit to a therapist, alone. My first visit to a hormone doctor, alone. My first visit in court to file a name change, alone. Throughout all these steps, I found something stronger within myself, something that any person embarking on this journey discovers. The true strength of who you are, who you are becoming, is within yourself. It is through your desire, your commitment, your desperate need to become the man, the woman, the human being that longs to break free. This is the strength that carries on throughout every step you take. Every needle stab, every tear from realizing you're either missing parts you wanted, or you have too many parts that aren't needed. Every day you grow stronger. Every day you notice the differences. The voice change, the facial structures, the growing hairs or less of it. Every glance in the mirror draws a growing smile. Each time a little bigger, a little wider, a little more you, just you, without a single ounce of embarrassment. I'm not sure where to begin. How to begin these things. Hi, my name is Jasper and I'm gay. Or should I go into a long winded explanation of how I've been tortured with desire for men and being attracted to the other boys in the soccer since I was young? We could also go with, hi, my name is Jasper and I'm transgender, but that doesn't feel right either. It feels too cliche to tell you all about how I knew from the second I was born that I was a female, how I always play with boy toys and wanted to cut my hair short. To be honest, that's not the truth either. Now, I, I think I'm gonna start with this. Hi, my name is Jasper. I'm 17 years old. I'm a high school senior. I have a cat named Juliet and two dogs named Winston and Rox. I'm gay and transgender. I've been out for many years now, but I've been out as gay for a long career. I've always been very public with my identity, no matter what trouble it got me into between peers or in school or online. I've always been very public with it because that's who I am. My mother tells me that I've always marched to the beat of my own drum. I've never been like everybody else in many ways. I didn't and still don't care for normal things. Anyway, um, I've always been very public with my identity, which has gotten me into some trouble. <laughs> The incident that stands out to me, though, is junior year in boys' bathroom. I'm sure I can see where this is going. Uh, there's this kid, who I won't name, who always wore a Trump MAGA backpack and either a camel or a bright orange hoodie. I wish I could say that I don't remember his name, and that's how insignificant he was, or still is to me, but that's not true. Um, it, it was a normal school day, and I had to go to the bathroom. So I did. Big mistake. I chose the exact time that this person was in the bathroom. He was leaving just as I was coming in the door. And once he saw me, he threw his hands up in frustration and defeat. Come on, man, seriously? They're letting you people in here now? What are you doing in here? Jesus Christ. <laughs> and he stormed out. <laughs> you, you know how you always think, if someone ever says some shit to me like that, I'd fire back twice as hard. 
you probably won't, just like I did. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't move. My gaze slowly fell from where his face was a moment ago to the bathroom floor as my mouth hung open. I shut my mouth, took a breath in, and turned out of the bathroom, forgetting all about how much it took off. I went back to where I was sitting in the guy's office, and I sat there staring into space, trying to figure out what had just happened. My mind was racing. I, I really wanted to talk to somebody, but what happened if I did? What if he came back harder? What, what if he attacked me for getting him in trouble? But then again, what if I didn't do anything? Would he do the same thing to another trans person? Would the same thing happen to one of my friends? What is worse? By this time, my feet had taken me to the door of my favorite teacher. She wasn't teaching, so I went in and I talked to her. I told her everything that had happened and how I was feeling, and she understood. She urged me to bring it to an administration if that's what I felt I wanted to do. So I did. The rest doesn't really matter. Um, I didn't use the guy's bathroom for a long time after that. But now I do without fear. I dare people to say something. I walk into the guy's bathroom with high heels and makeup on. I can't live my life in fear. And I won't. Because I know that I stand beside armies of trans people and allies willing to take up arms against those who stand against me. It wasn't until I was in college that my mother casually mentioned Marianne's sister and her girlfriend. Marianne was one of the people who worked at my daycare. I remember liking her, even if I don't remember anything about her. I moved away when I was five, so you can excuse my lack of memories. But what I did remember was that Marianne's sisters lived in the house next door, not Marianne's sister and her girlfriend. When asked, my mother shrugged. That's just not something you explain to a child. Well, at least she considered college old enough to know. She wasn't your everyday bigot or anything. She just wanted to shield me from things that I didn't need to be shielded from. Well, she didn't hate gay people by any means that one of her best friends in college had been gay. And he had committed suicide. Because even at that liberal school, the 70s were not a good time to be gay. Funnily enough, high school was old enough for her to tell me about the suicide while still glossing over the fact that he had been gay. My mom had another friend from college, one who I'd known my entire life, even if I only met her a handful of times. She was flighty, eccentric, spontaneous, generally irresponsible, which is why it was always weird that my type A mother had ever hung out with her. I was maybe 25 when I learned that this friend had not actually attended this college. Oh, she didn't go there. She was just always hanging out with us in the dorms. <laughs> I wonder how old I'll have to be before my mom finally admits that Cherry was her weed dealer. She spent my entire life shielding me from inconvenient truths until I'm old enough. But now I'm a grown adult who's seen more of the world than she has. So, mom, how old is old enough before you tell me my truth? Yeah, you might as well come clean. I already found out. You're not the only one who's privy to these secrets, even if you are the most tight-lipped of the bunch. How old is old enough before you tell me that I was born with a little extra something-something? And that little extra something-something was removed because that was the norm. 
look, I get it. That's not something I'd want to take onto the playground in the 90s. Pick a side, either play house and hopscotch or kickball and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, but show any sign that you may be crossing to the other side and kickball becomes. Well, and middle school wouldn't have been any better. A time when everyone is confused about their bodies and they attempt to crush their own confusion by crushing others beneath their heelys. Look, folks, early 2000s were weird. I got enough mockery for not having breasts. Imagine if this little piece of info got out. High school, I had enough on my plate already, right? So you didn't want to add to it. And by college, I was gone. Gone just like, well, you get it. Except you know where to find me. You know where I am. You could always call me up to casually chat and drop a bombshell. But by now it's just too late, right? Like when a friend texts you, but you don't want to respond right away. So you pretend that you're asleep. But then by the time you remember the text, too much time has gone by to answer. And then the longer it takes you to respond, the more awkward it is when you finally do. So what, mom, are you just never going to answer that text? You just wanted to protect me from my own truth. Like I said, I get it. But I can't help but think back to that one time when you outed someone else's truth to me. You had no business knowing. You had no business sharing. I certainly had no business knowing. But you privately told me about her diagnosis and how her parents chose to keep it a secret from her. You flat out use the words, it's a shame when parents hide things from their kids. It's a shame. Okay then. All this has taught me is that you'll never think I'm old enough to know myself, to know my own body. You think you know what's best for me. That's an old fashioned attitude mom. And it's all the evidence that I need to prove that you're too old for me to tell you the truth that matters. The truth is, you chose the wrong one. But I'll never tell. On my 37th birthday, after a lovely evening out with my family, I was sitting on the toilet. Oh, the two things aren't related. I'm just setting the scene, okay? I sat there that evening doing what we all do while sitting on the toilet, idly scrolling through Facebook. <laughs> and it was there that I happened across a post, randomly shared by a Facebook friend that I hardly know. And it said, if you're under the assumption that you're a cis man, but you've always dreamt of being a girl, and the only reason you don't transition is because you're afraid you'll be an ugly girl, that's dysphoria. You're literally a trans girl already. I feel like a bomb had gone off. I mean, my ears actually started ringing. I mean, who goes into a bathroom expecting to be faced with an existential crisis? I mean, it's not like I didn't know about trans people. It's just that I'd never connected the dots in a way that had formed a picture before that moment. And I'd especially never heard that term before, dysphoria. So despite the fact that all information posted on Facebook is trustworthy, I decided to research dysphoria myself, you know, just in case. I read all the articles, I took the online exams, and it kept coming back to the same result. I didn't relate to myself. So I put my game face on, I went through the motions for the rest of the night, and I went to bed, where I proceeded to spend hours going over all the reasons why I could never act on it. 
I mean, I had a wife and a kid. I mean, how would something like this affect them? Would my wife still love me? Would my daughter be bullied at school? I mean, oh crap, what about the other parents? Would I be bullied at her school? What about my job? I work in a mostly male dominated field. I mean, would they fire me? Like, could they fire me? Oh crap, and what about my family? I mean, my mom is pretty religious and on and on it went, but it kept coming back to one simple point. If I had a magic button that would instantly change me into a woman with no chance of turning back, I'd press it in a heartbeat. I did finally get to sleep. And when I woke up, it felt like the scene at the beginning of The Wizard of Oz. I literally felt like I was seeing color for the first time in my life. For longer than I can remember, I felt happy. So I sat with it, chewed on it, let it settle to see how it felt. I tried on a few new words. Woman. Wow, that's weird. But like, a good weird? Lesbian. Okay, that feels unearned, but accurate, I guess. I mean, how the hell did I not figure this out earlier? Well, you see, the thing that everyone forgets is that we all have exactly one way of experiencing the world, and that's us. We can't fathom that everyone else experiences the world differently, so we just assume everyone must work the same way. I've gone through life assuming everyone imagined themselves as the opposite gender. I mean, it just makes sense, right? I was literally taken aback when I realized that wasn't the case. And I mean, it didn't help that it didn't fit the description, so to speak. I mean, trans people in media, especially for those of us who grew up in the 80s, was depicted in one way without fail. Played with girls' toys, always knew they were different, were only into feminine things, and almost exclusively heterosexual. So how is somebody who played with G.I. Joes, never realized anything was wrong, and was exclusively attracted to women, supposed to realize who they were? So knowing all of this and realizing my white life was irrevocably at a crossroads, I imagined the paths in front of me. Could I continue on like nothing had happened, living my life as a man growing old and dying without ever actually being myself? And then I realized that doing that is what made me feel like I was living in black and white. I've been doing that for nearly 40 years and the thought of going back to that existence for even one more day felt like a literal hell. And down the other path, I mean, <laughs> was a little less clear, but holy crap, I could be me. We all get exactly one shot at this whole thing, and the thought of cheating ourselves out of happiness because of fear and doubt sounds insane. So, after three weeks of wrestling with it in private, I decided to tell my wife. I mean, it was a risk, a huge risk. And if she hadn't confided in me that she felt she might be pansexual, I don't know if I would have had the guts. I'm not gonna lie to you, it was the hardest thing I've ever had to do. And the weeks to follow had our lives in such a drastic upheaval, I constantly worried I completely destroyed my marriage of 14 years. I got lucky. My wife went into it with an open mind and we decided to just take it slow, one day at a time. I mean, we hit a little bump in the road every once in a while, but even those have gotten a little fewer and farther between as time has gone on. And my daughter? Well, the great thing about seven-year-olds is that they're right at that sweet spot where all of our lessons about acceptance are starting to take hold, but not old enough yet to realize most of what we're taught is bullshit. And I mean, she heard there was another girl in the house and she was pretty much sold. I mean, it's early still. And I haven't had to deal with the negative social aspects of this yet, but I know it's just on the horizon. But I look back at the fears that I had during the first few days of coming to terms with myself and I'm shocked to realize that fear is gone. I'm just me. <laughs> I get to be me like literally everybody else does their whole life. I mean, how weird is that? Anyway, 
the moral of this whole story is don't scroll through Facebook while sitting on the toilet. Just stick to Insta and TikTok. It's safer that way. When you reconstruct something, it means it is broken. Damaged goods no longer of use or value. When the floorboards begin to creak, the windows begin to rust, when the spiders crawl through the walls and the morning sun isn't visible anymore. You know it is time for renovations. I have reconstructed myself into a more tolerable image just for you. Strip my walls bare, simmer down my wits, diced my own voice into one more comfortable on your ears and put it in one big pot, a meal easy on the tongue, served on a silver spoon, ready for your digestion. I have spent years fabricating it. Normal childhood, bargain for invisibility. I kept my head lowered so often you would think it was taught in the textbooks. Spine coiled so far forwards as if I'm reaching into the grave that you've built for me. A ghost, as I was always meant to be. The hollow shell of a man lost in time itself. Cobwebs weave their way through fingerprints for all to see. A vacant graveyard that hasn't seen a footprint in decades. I can feel the words collapsing in my throat. A piercing pain. Stained glass from the local church, it sits in my mouth. Funny how colorful it looks, yet how sickly it tastes. It leaves my teeth in fragments, spoiled, rotten. So I grind them. Every time I hear the whisper of an insult, I bite my tongue. One day it will fall off and join the remains of my trans brothers and sisters. Empty shells of heroes. They deem me face of the gravestones. but I don't speak. Tape over my mouth, leaving me to swallow the pain. After all, I wouldn't want to make you uncomfortable, right? Wouldn't want to ask something personal, wouldn't want to pry into your trauma. I would never ask you when you knew you were cis. So when you attempt to pull back my curtains, you won't find anything but a thick smoke. For my problems are much too heavy on the lungs for you to bear. So I pass it off with, it's just the trans kind of thing. A trans kind of thing. They didn't think I'd make it to 16 kind of thing. They never talk in class kind of thing. They can't use the bathroom kind of thing. The two death threats kind of thing. They've been bullied since the sixth grade kind of thing. The silent teacher kind of thing the warp spine from binding kind of thing, the she, he, they, it kind of thing, the I will never be happy in this body kind of thing, <laughs> the scared of school kind of thing, the can't talk about it kind of thing, the lifespan cut in half kind of thing, the more than half of trans people attempt suicide kind of thing, the watching your LGBT idols get murdered kind of thing, the seeing my history be wiped away kind of thing. When you reconstruct something, it means it is broken. My heart strings pulled together by a single thread. Sometimes I don't have the heart to tell kids that high school is not an oasis. How do I tell them it isn't the heaven they were promised? No pearly golden gates, no puffy clouds, no teenage romance for us. My sister likes to say I'm a hopeless romantic. My idol eyes soaking in every bit of love I can see. 
because I could never grasp it for my own. For it is not mine to keep. So when I put on those rose-colored glasses for just a moment, the lens provide a new perspective. The reconstructions will fade until I am left with the blueprints of this broken home that is my body. So there I am. It's about three in the morning. Um, I'm wearing my Spider-Man pajama pants, a shirt and no binder, totally free, uh, hot pink slippers, and I'm walking to the local shell station to buy some Red Bulls because it's been a long night and it's only gonna get longer. I have one more paper to get done. And it's really completely my fault that I'm doing it this late, but that's a size of point. Well, I'm not really sure there is a point to this. Anyway, so I'm walking to the shell station. The little bell turns on the door. The cashier looks up at me and in his posture, I can see him saying, I'm both really happy that you're here because now I know that I'm not the last person on earth and everyone else died in the zombie apocalypse, so I've been stuck in here. And I was kind of disappointed because I was getting to a really good part of this YouTube video and now I have to pretend like I'm actually doing work or something. He, uh, he gives me a little once over and I can see the confusion in his eyes. He didn't say anything about it though. Just throwing a, hey, how are you? My way and looking back at his phone. I'm half asleep or more like half dead. So I just kind of smile and walk back to the drink. I grab a few Red Bulls in the tropical flavor, of course, it's the best one. And walk back to the cashier. I place the drinks on the counter and he says, this all, sir? <laughs> Hold on. Did she just call me, sir? Me, with no binder, hot pink slippers, and looking like a mountain of trash, sir? It, it takes me too long to respond, but eventually I say, oh, yeah, yeah, that's all. <laughs> uh, he brings me up and I don't really remember the rest. I, I was so focused on how he said, sir. I'm not the most passing guy. I think it's kind of obvious that I'm not cis, but this guy didn't care. It probably meant nothing to him, but it meant the world to me. <laughs> you find your true allies at 3 a.m. at a gas station, I guess. In my own space and time, I can see myself clearly. I know who and what I am. I am Griffin. I am they. I am non-binary and gender fluid and very real. And then the rest of the world comes in. And all at once, I am ma'am, miss, that girl, some lady observed briefly and categorized neatly and mostly I don't mind because I know myself. I have my own convictions, mostly. But that part of me that looks in the mirror and sees somebody handsome, that puts on a binder and feels at home in a body with a flat chest that wakes up from dreams in which I have a penis and wishes to fall back asleep. That part burns and aches and longs to take up space. The lenses through which everyone sees this body are not the body's fault. And I know that even if you take off your gender glasses, if you 
wrench them off your face and crush those lenses into the dirt, I know that even then the eyes can take some time to adjust. I'm still adjusting. I think that's just part of what humans do is adjust. Or at least we should. Because as it is now, doesn't it seem like it would be easier for me to be quiet? to lean into those days where I feel somewhat like a woman, try clinging on to that. Doesn't it seem like I'm making it harder on myself by allowing myself to be different? No. Oh. The pain of hiding far outweighs any judgment that I might face. Authenticity is worth more than automatic acceptance and trans identities, my identity, are not born of suffering. They come from a place of truth and exploration and joy. It is impossible to recognize and lament the struggle of trans people, the gender non-conforming, the gender defiant, while somehow holding the belief that these struggles come from within us or from thin air. We hurt because the systems in place hurt us. And if you're comfortable living in that world where the rights of your fellow human beings are constantly being thrown into new exciting kinds of jeopardy, well, think about it. Look closer. Hold it in your heart. Just hold the possibilities for a moment. Because those of us who live between the lines and outside of the boxes, we're real, always have been. And you know us, well, you, you know one of us now at the very least, one who is able to be heard and who's afraid, afraid for the lives and the happiness of my trans siblings. Afraid for myself that if I take steps to transition to adjust my body to whatever comfort level I might need, that I'll be denied opportunities or put in danger. Afraid that living somewhere in the middle isn't safe. And I have to admit, sometimes when I'm alone, this little ugly idea rears its head that I'm just some sad, confused girl trying to excuse my ineptitude at femininity by crying trans. It comes from somewhere that I don't like to visit, but I must. Because I'm not immune to the narrative. It comes from somewhere in me that holds the lifetime of nasty tales that I heard about trans people. My people. And I take it apart by teaching myself again and again what is true. That man and woman are not the only options. Because man and woman are first largely overlapping categories of human being, far more alike than they are different. Because intersex and gender variant people exist, no matter how many times they've been rejected and denied space because it's so, so made up as we go. And every single person is experiencing this ugly, messy, exquisite thing called gender uniquely. So fuck it. Today I woke up and I knew who I was. It was exactly who I needed to be. Tomorrow I might wake up and be a man or a woman, or probably neither or both. And that's the truth. That's my truth. And I am fortunate to be able to say this to you and trust that I will not be put in danger for it. I am putting my trust in you. Do you feel it? Use it. Be there for somebody else to trust. Because 
my community needs to be seen and supported and simply allowed to come to this world as we are. Well, I'm glad to live between the lines. I personally don't depend on anyone else believing in it for it to be true. But I thank anyone who understands it and who wants to understand it. I urge you to keep looking, keep adjusting with me. And I thank you in this moment now for seeing me.